So we are 43 pages into my 91 pages of notes uh, for this class. Um, and in a, in a very real sense, everything we've said so far has just been setting the stage for where we're going now. Um, we start our doctrine of revelation right now, our lecture on the doctrine of revelation. Everything's just kind of been preparing us for that moment. Um, <clears throat> our, our epistemological theories, um, the necessity for revelation, uh, really, we've just been setting the stage really for this moment. Um, everything else has been a bit of, I mean, the whole, the whole idea of prolegomena is that this is a prequel to all of our systematic theology, but this, everything has been really a prequel to, to this moment, once you start talking about the doctrine of revelation. Um, so the, this is lesson four, lesson four, the doctrine of revelation. Um, where do we start, okay? Where do we start when it comes to the doctrine of revelation? Um, if you were teaching a class on the doctrine of revelation, where would you start? Okay, maybe a Sunday school class. You have one hour to teach you about the doctrine of revelation. What would be your opening idea in the class? Talk to the person next to you about that. What would be your opening idea if you were teaching a Sunday school class on the doctrine of revelation? Okay, I want to introduce you. So this is our, this is our statement of faith, the editor's edition. Um, for Sovereign Grace Churches uh, that you all have. And you'll notice the first section is on the scriptures, okay? The first section is on the scriptures. And look at how it starts. It might not be what you would think. Where do we start with our theology of the scripture? Our eternal, transcendent, all-glorious God, who forever exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is by His very nature a communicative being. Okay, that's, so where this starts, and I think that this is right, where this starts is with the fact that God is a speaking God. Okay, God is a speaking God. Okay? Um, that's where our doctrine of revelation must always start. Um, in, in that sense, what, what we're not seeking to do is start with our own ideas. What we're not seeking to do is even where to find revelation. What we're not seeking to do is, is any of that. What we must start with is God, the speaking God. Did any groups say that? Any groups say that? Yes? Well done. Uh, our, our God, by his very nature, is a communicative being. Uh, Feinberg says this in his, uh, in his book, Light in a Dark Place, the Doctrine of Scripture, which we have in the back. If God exists and, but has remained silent, or if he has spoken, but his revelation is mere gibberish, the human race would be hopelessly lost in moral and spiritual darkness. This is what we were talking about earlier when we said that our, our theology, right, our theology is the study of God and his works in regards to creation. Right? But we start with God. To start, if we start our doctrine of revelation with God's works, we're skipping a step. We're skipping a step. We must, we must start with the idea of God himself. Our God, by his nature, is a communicative being. We already saw this in Genesis 1, verse 3. Before there's any creation, God says, let there be light. And there was light. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. John 17, the prayer between the Father, or between the Son to the Father. Jesus speaks in words. Or look at this, Hebrews 3, verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts in the rebellion. Okay. So this is a quote of Psalm. 95, I'm going to say Ganala, Martha. The Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. It's a girl. Now here's, here's something that your Greek will help you with significantly. This word, the Holy Spirit says, it's, it's in the present tense. You can see it in English, but it's even more clear in the original. Um, what 
is not said is the Holy Spirit said. What is said is the Holy Spirit says. Or we could even translate it like this. The Holy Spirit is saying. Psalm 95. He, he said it when it was spoken and he's continuing to say it today. Our God is a communicative being. He speaks. And he speaks in language. He speaks in words. This is so important because throughout the Bible... Idols are contrasted to God because idols are mute. Idols can't speak. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 2. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols. Idols can't speak. Yahweh can speak. This is throughout the prophets, but look at Habakkuk 2, verse 18 through 20. What profit is an idol when its maker shapes it? A metal image, a teacher of lies, for its maker trusts his own creation. It's pointing at the foolishness of idolatry, right? When he makes a speechless idol, right? The God is in contrast to the idols because they are mute, they are speechless. In contrast, God is a speaking God. There's a, a Trinitarian nature even to this idea of divine speech. If the Son is the Word, then the Father is the one who speaks Him, right? When God speaks, what does He speak? He speaks His Son. He speaks the Lagos. He speaks Jesus. He speaks the Son. That's another way to think about the relationship, the ontological relationship between the Father and the Son, is, is one of the speaker and the content of what's being spoken. The Spirit, then, is the one who makes that speech, the Son, effective, right? With it, then, divine speech carries with it divine authority. Divine speech carries with it divine authority. John Frame's uh, doctrine of the Word of God is especially helpful for me here. Because God's speech possesses God's attributes. Have you noticed this? God's words possess his attributes. Can someone read Psalm 119, verse 7? Psalm 119, verse 7. How is God's word described? It's perfect. Or it's righteous. Right? That's a quality of God, right? Perfection, righteousness, those are qualities of God himself, right? But here it's, des it's describing his word. Okay, how about Psalm 119, 89? I'm sorry, 86, Psalm 119, 86. How is God's word described there? They are sure, right? They're steadfast, or they're faithful in the original. They're faithful. So they're righteous and they're faithful. How about Psalm 119, 142? How is God's word described there? Yeah, righteous, good. Read the whole verse if you could. Your law is true. It's truth. Do you, do you see? These are divine attributes being ascribed to God's law or God's words. God's words possess divine attributes. But, but more than that, God's words can do things only God can do. Okay? Okay. Uh, can someone read Hebrews 4, 12 through 13? Good. So do you, do you see God's word is able to discern things in that text? That, that's a quality. That, that's a quality not of my speech. My speech is not able to discern things. My, my speech uh, is not an extension of who I am. But, but God's speech is able to discern things. It's able to do things that only God himself can do. And, and, and finally, or thirdly, God's word receives praise. Uh, God's word receives praise. Now that, that makes no sense 
Because only God is worthy of worship, only God is worthy of praise. To, to praise something other than God is idolatry. However, Psalm 56, verse 4, look at this. And God, whose word I praise. I praise God's word. Look at verse 10 of the same psalm. In God, whose word I praise. In the Lord, whose word I praise. Another word for praise is worship. God's word is receiving worship or praise here. Psalm 119, verse 120. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. He, he has fear of God, but also fear of God's word. How, how can this make sense? Well, it makes sense. There's two ways to make sense of it. Number one, God's word takes upon the divine attributes as, as an extension of himself and his presence. It makes his will effective. But in another sense... It makes only true sense in light of the Word made flesh, who is Christ. In fact, I think, and we'll see this more in our preaching class, there's many times in Scripture when it seems that God's Word has a double meaning. That there's, there's both God's Word that's written down and heard and spoken, but, but God's ultimate Word, who is Christ, who, who alone is able to be called living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, not, not that words are God. Not that words are God, but God is both author, God is the author of divine revelation, and God is the subject of divine revelation. That's key. God is the author of divine revelation, and God is the subject of divine revelation. God speaks, and when he speaks, he speaks about himself, and specifically he speaks about his son. Fourthly, God's word uh, brings to us God's presence. So, so throughout scripture, certainly God is omnipresent. God is everywhere present, right? So I'm, I'm not denying the omnipresence of God. However, in Scripture, God's presence, especially his, his covenantal presence among his people, is seen in a burning bush. It's seen in a pillar of fire. It's seen in a cloud of smoke. There, there's a special presence of God that's often located in what theologians call theophanies, right? Um, but, but, but where does God dwell in the Old Testament? Where does the Bible say that God dwells? He dwells between the cherubim, above the Ark of the Covenant, right? God dwells above the mercy seat. God is everywhere present, but God is specially present covenantally there. And what you will find throughout Scripture is that wherever God's Word is present, God is present, in that special way. In fact, God is present above the mercy seat because what is inside of the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments. And eventually the whole of the Torah and the book of Joshua as well. So wherever God's word is present, God is present. God's spirit, who makes the word effective, Genesis 1-2, the spirit is hovering over the waters, and then God says, let there be light. Compare that to Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, by the breath of his mouth all of their hosts. The spirit was actively present when God spoke at creation. The Spirit was actively present when God spoke in creation. And, similarly, the gospel takes effect in people's hearts when the word proclaimed is made effective by the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 Our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and the Holy Spirit and full conviction. Similarly, when the Bible was written... 2 Peter 1, 21, 
the Holy Spirit carried men along as they wrote it. He was present in the moment that God was speaking Scripture, present in speaking in creation, present in making his word effective to save people, present in the writing of Scripture itself. The Holy Spirit was present. So John Frame from Westminster Theological Seminary says this, So the word is God. When we encounter the word of God, we encounter God. When we encounter God, we encounter his word. We cannot encounter God without his word or the word without God. We cannot encounter God without his word or the word without God. God's word and his personal presence are inseparable. His word, indeed, is his personal presence. Whenever God's word is spoken, read, or heard, God himself is there. So God speaks, and when he speaks, he is personally present. And that that even makes sense with the analogy of speech itself, right? I mean, apart from the telephone, which is a recent invention, you can't really speak without being present, right? I mean, to, to an ancient mind, even when you think about the idea of God speaking, it implies the fact that God is present when he is speaking, right? He must be present if he is speaking. So that's that's the first idea, is God is a speaking God. Number two, um, God speaks in language. God speaks in language. So God is a speaking God, and God speaks in language. And my goodness, this is important. Uh, Everything... All of our bibliology hinges on this. If this isn't true, throw the Bible out. If this isn't true, throw the Bible out. God speaks in language. Jesus is the Word made flesh. When the Trinity speaks, they speak speak in language to one another, as we've already seen. What this means is language is not a property that God adds to himself. It's not a property that God adds to himself. Language is not a product of human evolution. Language is not a human idea that God looks down and says, Oh, that's creative. Let me try that. Rather, we find immediately from Genesis 1, verse 28, that God speaks to the man and the woman. He creates them, and he immediately speaks to them. With no time for language to be created by Adam and Eve, in the meantime, no, God creates them, fully capable of speech. God creates them fully able to understand and to dialogue. Speaking in language is intrinsic to who God is. And when we speak in language, we speak in language because we're made in the image of God. When we speak in language, we speak in language because we're made in the image of God. This is contrasting liberal or post Christian theologies which say God can't be known through language. He's known best through experience. Because God is above language. God is beyond language. Language is something beneath God. And so really the best way to communicate to God is just to experience Him. If that were true, then of course the the Bible would not be a sure means of God revealing himself. Actually, they would say it like this. Language is a barrier. Okay? Language is a barrier to us knowing God. Language makes the infinite finite. It makes the indescribable describable. Uh, And so language is a barrier. And so what that means is the, the Bible is really the best we have. Right? The Bible is really the best we have, but what we really need is something beyond the Bible. We need to move beyond the Bible to some kind of experience of God outside of language. The Bible is the best we have, but we don't really experience God in the pages. That's, that's liberal and post-Christian theology, but even within charismaticism, God is best known 
through the experience of speaking in tongues. Something beyond language. What, what we need is a, a heavenly language. What we need is angelic language that we don't even understand what we're saying. And then once we do that, that's how we truly experience God. The, the Bible is a good starting point. But what we really need is to move past it to something else. Until you've had indescribable experiences of God, you don't know God. Right? Well, what you really need is to have an indescribable experience of God, and that's when you've come to know him. The Bible would say this it could not be further from the truth. The Bible would say this could not be further from the truth. And in fact, the fellowship bonds we see in Scripture between God and men are always through divine speech. They're always through divine speech. They're not through indescribable encounters. No, 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 no. They're through God speaking. And in fact, the main drive of the Bible's story is the story of divine speech. Will God speak or not? And when he does, how does that affect the narrative of the story? It's, it's very, very, very different. We, we don't see Adam, after the fall, having some kind of experience of God that he couldn't possibly describe. No, no, no. God just speaks. Adam listens, and the story continues. And, and this is true even before the fall as well, is it not? Even before the fall, God speaks to Adam, and Adam understands him. Language, language is at the foundation of the very first divine and human relationship. Language is at the foundation of it. And when God speaks promises of restoration... He speaks it in language. Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The promise, the promise through which people enter into saving relationship with God is given in language. What's the height? What's the height even of <clears throat> Abraham's relationship with God? It's in Genesis 15. <clears throat> After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham. Fear not, I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. And, and Abraham dialogues with God. And God, when God gives a picture, so God gives a picture, right, later on in the chapter that he interprets through words, okay? So he gives a picture, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, now he explains the meaning of the image, Right? The, the image itself is incomplete without interpretation of the image. And you will find that throughout the Bible story. Image, miracle, action is always accompanied by divine revelation. So that without, in divine revelation through word, without divine revelation through word, action and picture are meaningless. We're, we're left to our own how to interpret them, but God never works like that. God does not leave us to our own to interpret, rather he interprets himself so that we would know what he means. Think of Moses. Think of Moses at the burning bush. There is a bush that's on fire, but it's not consumed. And immediately following that, Moses sa or God says to Moses, I will dwell with my people. And then he shows up as fire again in the midst of the people, Right? What's the meaning of the burning bush? The meaning of the burning bush is clear. God, who you would think would consume his people. God, the consuming fire, who you think him and his people could never dwell together. Somehow, the fire and the bush will dwell together, and the bush will not be consumed. Israel will not be consumed, even though the fire of God's presence dwells in her midst. And when Moses asked to see God's glory, okay, this is the height. This is the height of divine revelation in the Torah. Moses says, let me see your glory. Okay, right? 
Let me see your glory. The Lord says to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know your name. And Moses said, please show me your glory. If I ask you to show me something, hey, show me your phone. Hey, show me, show me, you know, show me that painting you drew. Hey, show me this, show me that, show me that. You're going to hold something up for me to look at. It's a visual. Show is a visual idea. So you would think that God would respond with a visual picture. But he doesn't. He responds with a proclamation. The Lord, I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and show mercy to whom I will show mercy. God's self-disclosure is through words. God's self-disclosure is through words. David, think of David. When, when God makes a covenant with David, 2 Samuel 7, he does so with words. When God confronts David for his sin, sleeping with Bathsheba, he does so through words. Think of even Jesus at his baptism. There's a picture of the dove descending, but then God interprets it. The dove descends and the father says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Think of Jesus when he's tempted in the wilderness. He's quoting the Bible throughout. Or Jesus when he performs miracles. He does so most of the time through speech. So, so in, instead... Instead of the idea that, that what you really need is an experience of God beyond language, the, the Bible doesn't support that at all. No, language is how God reveals himself. In fact, when we look into heaven, as we already saw, language is the means by which people worship God. Rather than, rather than dying and then getting beyond language one day, the worship of God in heaven is through language. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Revelation 4, verse 8. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, full of eyes all around and within, and day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The elders cast their crowns before the throne and say, worthy are you. There's no account here. There's no account here of some experience beyond language. John could have written that. John could have written and said, I couldn't understand a word they were saying. Or the experience was so amazing, I can, the best I can do is describe it. No, no, no. When he describes heavenly worship, he does so with words. In fact, beyond worship, Trinitarian conversation is always in language. Genesis 1, 26. God said, let us make man in our image. Genesis 2, verse 18. The Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will find him a helper fit for him. Psalm 2. As for me, I have set... My king in Zion, my holy hill, I will tell of the, the, the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Psalm 110, John 17, Hebrews 1, the Trinity speaks to one another in words. Think even of Titus 1, verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. God made a promise of eternal life before the ages began. Who existed before the ages began? Only God. So if God promises eternal life before the ages began, who did he promise it to? Himself. And what theologians call, and we'll learn about this in hermeneutics and biblical theology, the covenant of redemption, in which the Father, the Son, and the Spirit promise one another that they will redeem the elect. Words, then, 
are intrinsic to who God is. Our God is a speaking God. He's not like the mute and deaf and dumb idols. So instead, God's word, God's word is his creative tool. We saw this earlier with Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. God did not make the word, world with ideas. God did not make the world with thoughts. God made the world with speech. Let there be light. What's the implication here? The implication, the implication is that divine speech is a quality of God. And we reflect who God is when we speak. We reflect who God is when we speak. Speech, speech is what makes God, God. Speech is what makes God, God. Psalm 115. 1 through 8, that's got to be what it is. Okay. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name, give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and faithfulness. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens, and he does all, their plea, all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they don't speak. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. Noses, but they don't smell. They have hands, but do not feel. Feet, and do not walk. They do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. So, so with that then, speech. Speech is part of who God is. It's part of what makes God God. Therefore, therefore, okay, all of that was a lot. Therefore, speech is an appropriate form of divine revelation. Speech is an appropriate form form of divine revelation. It's adequate. It, it reveals. Speech reveals. If, if we don't have this, once again, throw out your Bible. Throw out your Bible and go and live in the mountains somewhere and hope you can experience God through something besides speech. <clears throat> Language is not a human product. Language is a divine product. And we create more human languages out of necessity, right? But God is a speaking God, and language is intrinsic to who he is. Now, this is, this is essential for revelation to actually accomplish its purpose. What's the intent of revelation? To reveal, <laughs> right? Revelation is meant to reveal. If revelation doesn't reveal... And it doesn't accomplish its purpose, right? If we call the Bible revelation, which it is, but it doesn't actually reveal because speech is God limiting himself, well, then it doesn't actually reveal anything. No, it, language, then, is an adequate means of God revealing himself. Incarnation is a, is a picture of this, okay? The Word made flesh... Look at Colossians 2.9. In him, the whole fullness of God dwells bodily. In him, the fullness of God dwells bodily. Revelation, get this, Revelation doesn't obscure. Revelation doesn't obscure, Revelation reveals. So the body of Christ, it doesn't obscure it reveals. It's an, it's an actual revelation of God. The, the incarnation actually does show us God. It doesn't obscure God to us. It actually shows us God. Now, now, certainly God reveals to us in ways that we understand, right? He doesn't reveal to us in ways that we don't understand, but he makes us. God makes us so that we would understand his revelation. God made us to be speaking people so that we could receive spoken revelation. Right? With that, then, and we'll talk about this when we talk about general revelation, human beings are a form of general revelation. Why do we have eyes so that we can understand that God sees? 
Why do we have ears so that we can understand that God hears? And we speak so we can understand that God speaks. Jesus in the incarnation is not less than God because he dwells in bodily form. Jesus is truly God in bodily form. What that means is the mode of revelation does not mean the revelation is less than full revelation. Right? If that's true of the incarnation, it's true of language as well. Jesus wasn't a distorted version of God. He is the fullness of deity dwelling in a body. When, when, when you saw Jesus' face, you saw God's face. When you touched his body, you touched God. He wasn't an obscuring. He was the fullness of God bodily. The implications for Scripture in the Bible, God has not obscured himself using human words in the writing of Scripture. He is truly and fully revealed himself in human language. He, he doesn't distort. He doesn't obscure. He fully reveals so that the words written down in Scripture, 100% the words of God. If they're not, then revelation doesn't actually reveal. But God, God uses things we're familiar with, right? And he create, God creates a world so that we would understand him more. Why did God create rocks? So that he could say, I'm a rock. Why did God create the sun? So he could say, I am light. Why does God create anything that he creates so that this world, which, which is a sacramental world, would tell us who God is. Why did God create marriage? God created marriage so that we would know what Christ in the church is like. Mar marriage is not something that humans came up with. Marriage is a divine idea so that we would know what Christ in the church is like. It reveals. <coughs> Rock, fire, light, all of this. Why, why, why does God make families? Why does God make fathers who beget children so we would know what he's like? So we would know what adoption is. So we would know what it means to be called sons of the Most High God. So we would know what it's, it means that there is a father and there is a son. God creates realities that are intrinsic to himself. He creates realities in our world that are intrinsic to himself so that those realities might reveal him and so that he might use words to reveal himself in relationship to those realities. Now, now I, want, I want to be clear, though, with that. This doesn't mean... This doesn't mean that there's no room for non-linguistic experiences of God. They happen in Scripture. There are non-linguistic experiences of God. But, that is to say that these experiences aren't extra-linguistic or beyond language or something we need to attain to. We, we're not trying to get beyond language in our experience of God. Consider Romans 8.26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray what was we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Right? There, there, are, there is such thing as just, oh, I don't even know how to say what I'm feeling right now. And the Spirit expresses those feelings to God. That's what that means, right? The Spirit expresses those things to God for us. There are times that we are limited that doesn't mean God is. But this text does give us, give us an idea that there are, there are such things as non-linguistic experiences of God, but, that, but there aren't extra-linguistic. Or super-linguistic, super-linguistic, beyond speech. So with, with that, this, this speech, though, this speech, here's, here's what we have to know in this. It's, it's so gracious. 
God is gracious in divine speech, isn't he? Um, when God is gracious in the fact that he does speak at all to us, right? But, but he's gracious. He's gracious in the content of his speech as well. The content of his speech is gracious speech. Because the content of his speech is the Logos. The content of his speech is Christ. But, but even, even, even the text, the texts which, the texts which speak of judgment in the scriptures, they are gracious of the Lord as well. They're gracious of the Lord as well um, because they warn. They call to repentance. They, 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 they tell us of what will happen if we do forsake this God. And if he didn't tell us that, that would be less than gracious, right? He, he is gracious to tell us and to warn us. And for him to not speak, for him to not speak is a sign of judgment. Think of Amos 8, 11 through 12. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but for hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. God not speaking is a sign of judgment. So, so he speaks, and when he speaks, he speaks. The, the fact that he does speak is gracious, and the content of his speech is also gracious, because when God speaks, he speaks his son. God speaks in language is what we said. Um, and, and having established that God has speech, um, and that's the only possible way of knowing him, we, we do have to... We do have to think for a moment about a problem, okay? This, this does raise a problem, and that's the problem of divine thought versus human thought. Okay? Um, so, the idea of divine thought versus human thought, um, and, and how do they relate to one another? Divine thought versus th human thought. Um, we, we move on to the difficult question of the adequacy of God's revelation, right? Uh, even, if God, even if God does speak, is it possible to understand him? Right? If he speaks in language, if, if his thoughts are so much greater than ours, you know, can he actually speak in ways that we understand? Or what's the thought, what's the relationship between God's thoughts as creator and our thoughts as creature? Um, are there quantitative differences between our thoughts? Or are there qualitative differences between our thoughts? So let's look at 1 John 4.8. 1 John 4.8. Okay. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God, God is love. God is love. What, what does it mean that God is love. What is love? Do you know what love is? Have you experienced love and truth? Or, or let's say it like this, when, when I say to my wife, I love you, do I mean the same thing that God means when God says to her, I love you? Right? Or, or even when I say to God, I love you, do I mean the same thing that God means when he says to me, I love you? Right? Or let's look at 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. What? When God calls us his children, do we, does he mean the same thing that we mean when, when I speak of my children? Clearly not. So, so then, it, 
is the fact that God speaks at all kind of a moot point, right? Um, who cares if God speaks if, if what God intends to communicate with his speech is so different than our own experience of those same words, right? If, if I and God mean something different when we say the same words, love, children, father, if we mean different things, um, is it even worth the idea of divine language and human language? Let's, let's think for a bit about the discontinuities between God's thoughts and our thoughts, okay? First of all, God never learns. God never learns. Either through thought or experience, we, though, we grow in understanding, do we not? Uh, God has knowledge of all things. We have only limited knowledge. So even with that, if, if God talks about the sun, the moon, the stars, when no human has ever been to the sun and the stars, then do we even know what we're talking about? Can we even understand the analogy? Um, God knows all things fully, and we have limited knowledge of the things that we do know. God's thoughts are uncreated and eternal. Our thoughts happen in a moment of time. God's thoughts are original. Our thoughts are derivative. Our, our thoughts would not exist without God. How much more are our thoughts less than God's thoughts? God has no conflict or contradiction in his thoughts, but we do. And God's truth, right, the only truth that actually matters, often seems contradictory in our minds. So if that's the case, if, if God's truth, the only truth that actually matters, seems contradictory to us, then, then do we even understand what truth is at all? In addition to this, God has not revealed all truth to us, right? Deuteronomy 29, 29, we quoted earlier. There are secret things that belong to the Lord. In one sense, then, if God is incomprehensible, we can't know or even list all the differences between us and him, right? Right? We can't know them, and we can't list them. I've, I've given you seven, but how many more could there be? Perhaps, at least in our minds, infinitely more differences. Again, I mean, the secret things belong to the Lord, so who knows what in those secret things would be additional differences between us and God. Is this a problem when it comes to divine revelation? If God and us use the same words, but we mean different things, uh, can God, the fact that God speaks at all, does that even matter? Talk to the person next to you about that. How would you answer this objection? How would you answer that objection? The difference between our thoughts and God's thoughts and the adequacy of revelation and language. Talk to the person next to you about that. If God's thoughts are so different than our own, and God's experiences are so different than our own, um, then does he actually reveal with language, right? Or does he not? If I say, I love you, and I mean something different than when God says those same words, then do we even know what it means when God says, I love you, right? Does that make sense? Does that clarify? Okay, how... How do we get past this problem? Is there an answer to this problem, or is there not? Okay, what do you think? What are your answers? What do your groups say? Yeah, we have the Holy Spirit. That's a great, yeah. It's a great addition. Good. Yeah, God will make sure. He is understood. That's great. That's very good. Yeah. So I gave a bunch of problems. You all have given excellent solutions. Let me, let me do give with this some ways in which our thoughts are similar to God's thoughts, right? I, I've listed ways that they're different. Let me give you ways that are similar. Um, 
God's thoughts and our thoughts have the same standard of truth. Or they should anyway, right? God himself. So our, our goal, our goal as theologians and our goal as Christians is that our minds would be shaped by God, right? Um, which means our, our standard of truth would be shaped by God. Um, may, it could be, it could be that we don't know what love is. It could be that we don't know what love is um, <clears throat> at first, but keep reading, right? So God is love. Then we ask, well, what is love? Have we actually ever experienced love? Do I mean the same thing that God means? But look at verse 9. In this the love of God was manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world. So, so it's not as if God has left us without any demonstrations of what love is. Right? We, we know what love is because God has loved us, right? So, so then, when I tell my wife, I love you, that's informed not primarily by what I, by what I think love is, but what God has shown me that love is, right? So, so and, and what I mean by I love you now is different than what I meant eight years ago or nine years ago. Right? It's, it's different because it's more informed by what God says that love is. Right? So, so we have the same standard of truth. Our thought, or we should anyway, our thoughts and God's thoughts. Number two, both us and God may think about the same thing. Right? We're able to think about the same thing um, and have the same conclusion about those things. Right? Me and God both affirm the resurrection of Jesus, right? We both affirm that Jesus rose from the dead. So an atheist may say something is beautiful that God doesn't find beautiful, right? And so he's wrong, <laughs> right? It's not beautiful because who cares what he thinks? We care what God thinks, right? Good. Um, so we can both say the same thing about the same thing. Jesus rose from the dead. Um, <clears throat> number three, e even if God's knowledge is something extensive and ours is partial, that doesn't mean that we possess no knowledge at all, right? Um, now, of course, God's no God is infinite, so his knowledge is infinite, which I don't even know fully what that means, but it must be true. Um, so, but if we were to say that's all of God's knowledge and this is what we know, it's not like what we know isn't true, <laughs> Right? It's within the realm of reality. It's within the realm of possible knowledge. With that, just practically speaking, when God says, don't murder, no one sits around and says, what do you think murder is? We all kind of know, right? <laughs> we all just kind of know what God means. When God says, don't commit adultery, no one says, well, what really is adultery? No, 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 no. If you're saying that, you're a moron. <laughs> and you're probably looking for an excuse Right? We know what those words mean. There's continuities. There are continuities between our thoughts and God's thoughts. And so the answer, the answer for this lies in a few things. I'm going to give you um, five answers, and these come from Calvin. These come from Calvin. So five answers. The first is the found in the creator-creature distinction. So we'll say the, Cal the Calvinist answer. So number one, the creator-creature distinction. The creator-creature distinction. That's the diagram we drew earlier. God, us, and we're different. There's a, the difference, though, is not an obstacle to overcome. It's intended by God. Um, the difference between God and us is first ontological and not moral, as we've already said before. So by design, we are different than God. That's number one. Okay. Number two, human speech is, an, is imaging God. Um, human speech as image of God. Psalm 94.9. He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, 
does he not see? Right? It's what we were saying earlier. Why do we have ears? Why do we have eyes? So we would know what God is like. Right? So we could also say, he who formed the mouth, does he not speak? Okay, number three, divine speech. Slash, God is creator. Okay, so, so God created, as we mentioned before, physical realities for the purpose of revealing himself. God created re- physical realities for the purpose of revealing himself. Deuteronomy 32, 4. The rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness without iniquity, just and upright is he. If God wanted to say in words that he is a rock, then he created a rock so we would understand it, right? The fact that we have a physical world shows that God is working to bridge that gap. And all non-physical realities are communicated to us by God, right? So metaphors. Metaphors exist in the mind of God before they existed in human realities. Stories, poetry, prose, or the idea of faithfulness, truthfulness, love, all of that exists in God far before we ever experience it, okay? It's, it's located up here and not down here. So in the same way that we didn't create language, we, we didn't create what a metaphor is. We didn't create what poetry is. God, God existed knowing what poetry is and even, according to Psalm 2, speaking in poetry before we ever did. We discovered poetry because it existed in God first. Number four, divine speech and divine ability. Divine speech and divine ability. To conclude that God cannot speak to us in a way that we understand is to say God is not able to do something. It's, it questions omnipotence. It questions the fact that God is able to do whatever his holy will desires. Now, God can do anything he wants. God can do anything he wants, and that includes speaking in ways we understand. Uh, really, it's saying God is limited in some way. God, God really desires that he would speak and that we would understand, but he's really not able to. He's just up in heaven saying, I hope they figure it out. It's quite a weak God. It's not the God of Scripture. So, so to conclude also that God cannot speak in ways we understand is to say that God failed to reveal through revelation. God's not able, and God failed. It's also to say that God is not the master of language. To, to say that God is not the ultimate speaker. To say that language is not intrinsic to who God is. And, and, or if it is intrinsic to who God is, he's, he's really not good enough at it. Like, language is something that he's all right at, but not something he's an expert at. No, no, no. He is fully able to communicate because he is the master of language. So, so with that, with that is the idea of analogy. Divine speech and analogy. Okay. So there's, there's three views... There's three views of speech, okay? There's three views or three ways in which speech is typically understood, divine speech and theological speech. Um, The first we could call the literal, the literal. So, So when we read words about God, they mean exactly the same things that we mean in an ordinary language. God is good means the same thing as... Shawarma is good. Yefiotibs, <laughs> gondo no. means the same thing. Clearly, that can't be the case. Clearly, I don't mean the same thing. Clearly, when I say God is love or God loves you, I don't mean the same thing when I tell my wife that I love her. So this, it can't be the literal. It can't be literal. The second is figurative. 
So, so we use the same words that God uses, but we mean them in entirely different ways. Entirely different ways. So God says, I love you. I say, I love you. But we really mean completely different things. We, we mean something completely different when we talk about love and our experience of love and what love even means. This would certainly be odd. Would it not that we mean an almost opposite things or different things that doesn't seem to make any sense. So the last one is analogy. Analogy. And this is what Calvin, this was Calvin's view, and I think that he's right. Um, so while words have different references when applied to God, that doesn't mean that the words are figurative, okay, or that they mean completely different things. No, there's the difference, this is the difference, the difference is in degree, not in kind. The difference is in degree and not in kind. So while human love is certainly different than divine love, we don't mean different things, right? God's love is just more intense, and God's love is just more pure, and God's love is more single-minded. But I don't mean something radically different when I say love. And God thinks of, when God thinks of love, he thinks of a completely different thing. It's different in degree, but not in kind. It's analogy. So, So divine words, divine words have fuller meaning than what we understand them to mean. Okay? Think of righteousness. Think of righteousness, or, or think of truth, or, or think of faithfulness. God means something more than we understand Him to mean, because we're limited in our faithfulness. We're limited in our righteousness. We're limited in our goodness. He means something more than we hear, but He doesn't mean something different than what we hear, right? He, he means a righteousness beyond what we have ever experienced, a faithfulness beyond what we've ever experienced, a love beyond what we've ever experienced, but, it, but it's, it's not something different, okay? When God says, I love you, he means something fuller and more complete than we could ever possibly imagine, but not something different than what we imagine. Difference is in degree and not in direction. So with that, we, we know, we know things with certainty. We know that two plus two is four, right? But do we know it in the same way that God does? No. We, we discover that two plus two is four. But God, God, two plus two is four, existed in the mind of God before we were ever created. So John Frame, again, is helpful. He says this, God's love is more than our language can grasp, but surely not less. God's love is more than our language can grasp, but surely not less. So that's, that's Calvin's answer, and I, th- I think he's right. Language is actually, commun- God's revelation is actually communicating. God's language actually does communicate. But it always means more than we could imagine. Okay, well, let's, let's then get into the next question. What is revelation? What is revelation? So, so having established that God is a speaking God, and that God, God's speech communicates truth claims to his creatures, and that we are able to understand them, we must now ask, what is divine revelation, and what is our relationship to it? First, revelation is a divine activity not a human activity. Revelation is a divine activity and not a human activity. God is the subject of revelation. He is the one doing it. Revelation is an act of personal communication from God to us, okay? It's something that God does. The basis of theology is not human discovery or human thought. Theology is not a process of discovery wherein we unveil brand new truths and new information about God. Theology is a process of discovery 
as we listen, right? Theology is a process of discovery as we listen, as we listen to what God has said. Calvin says this, no drop will be found of either wisdom and light or of righteousness or power or genuine truth which does not flow from him and of which he is not the cause. Theology, theology then, is a process of listening well and articulating what God has said. Listening well and articulating what God has said. Knowledge, knowledge of God, to use philosophical language, is not intrinsic. It's not a priori. We, we don't possess it by nature of being human. It's not innate to our humanity. It's something we must receive, John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing, even theologizing. You can do nothing without him. God, however, knows himself fully. Right? God, God, God isn't in a process of self-discovery. God knows everything, including everything about himself. Therefore, God is the subject of revelation. He's the author of revelation. He's the one doing rev the revealing. Um, it, do it doesn't lie in humanity, then, to discover new things about God. Uh, even the idea that revelation, or the basis of our theology, is something in us, is to deny the creature creator-creature distinction. Right. If we know anything about God, it's because God has first revealed to us. Theology is not us looking in to ourselves. Theology is us receiving from God. 1 Timothy 6, 15 through 16 says this. Keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality and who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. He is the blessed sovereign. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. The nature of God then, the nature of God necessitates revelation. We can't approach him. He dwells in unapproachable light. We need him to reveal. He can't be seen. He can't be approached. We are intentionally designed to live in dependence upon God. God, on the other hand, by his very nature, needs no one. God needs no one. So God must be the subject, the author of theology, if he is to be the object, the one studied in theology. There's no way for God to be the object of theology if he is not the subject of theology. Revelation prece proceeds any understanding of who God is. Before we ever knew anything about God, he was speaking about himself. So then, revelation is something God does, not us. So we're not sitting around at the coffee shop talking about what do you think God is like? What do you think God is like? What do you think God is like? No, no, no. The only proper source of revelation about God is God himself. So then, that God's the subject. God is the subject of revelation. But more than that, he's also the object. He's the subject, and he's the object. So that when, when God reveals, he reveals himself. When God reveals, he reveals the most significant thing imaginable, himself. He's not revealing random 
bits of knowledge that are fun trivia bits. He, he's not revealing to make us, you know, more interesting people. He, he's not get an ad on my phone sometimes that talks about, you know, get this app and it will distill all these books down into little manageable bits. And, and the tag for the, the ad is always become the most an interesting person in the room, right? Um, if, you, if you get this app, you'll have the knowledge to become the most interesting person in the room. That, that's, not, that's not why God reveals. He doesn't reveal so that we become the most interesting person in the room. So that we have more trivia bits than other people. Uh, he, he's not revealing those things. He could if he wanted to. There are wonders of physics and wonders of chemistry and wonders of biology that the Bible seems disinterested in. The Bible reveals God. The Bible reveals God. So, so creation, so if we're thinking about general revelation, um, uh, Psalm 19, the heavens declare what? The glory of God. Creation is revealing God, right? And the, the greatest revelation of God is given in the revealed God, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one to whom, sorry, let me, I won't quote it, I'll go to it. Matthew eleven, twenty-seven. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Again, not random bits of interesting information so you become the most interesting person in the room. No, the object of revelation is God. God is revealing Himself. Okay, John 1.18 no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. John 14, 7 through 9. If you have known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do, not, you do know Him and have seen Him. Philip said to Him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to Him, have I been with you this long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Christ is the greatest revelatory act of God, and what does he reveal? He reveals the Father. When God reveals, he reveals himself. So the purpose of revelation is that we would know God. That, that radically shapes what you think preaching is about. <laughs> that radically shapes how you do your devotions in the morning. That radically shapes what, bits, what, what, what you think of when you read different parts of Scripture. It's, it's about God. It's all about God. And, and it's all about His Son, the greatest revelation of God. The goal, the goal of Revelation, John 17, 3. This is eternal life that they may know you. The goal of Revelation is that we would know God. 1 John 1. This is the message, the revelation that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. But why do they proclaim? So that you may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The purpose of revelation is fellowship with God through Christ. The purpose of revelation is fellowship with God through Christ. He reveals to us to make friends with us. He reveals to us to make friends with us. That's the goal of Revelation. That's what Revelation is all about. Lastly, what is Revelation? So that's, that's the intent of Revelation. That's how Revelation comes to us. That's the goal of Revelation. Lastly, though, Revelation is historical. Revelation is historical. 
So God roots his revelation in history and not outside of history, okay? That, that, that means, when we talk about this more in biblical theology, the Bible isn't just a golden tablet dropped down from heaven, not interested in history, not, not interested in God's relationship with people through history. No, God roots his revelation in history. It's, it's not like Muhammad just went into a tent and came out with, here we go, let's do it. It's not like Joseph Smith who received the golden tablets and was able to read it and, okay, we're good to go, we're done. Where'd those golden tablets go? I don't know. They're, it's the only gold in the world that never disappeared. It's rooted in history, um, which ultimately is necessary for Christ, right? When the fullness of time had come, God revealed. He sent forth his Son. And that act of revelation is, look at verse 5, for the purpose of redemption. All of God's revelation is for the purpose of redemption. That's why we're Christ-centered. That's why we're gospel-centered. That's why the Bible is Christ-centered. And that's why the Bible is gospel-centered. It's all about Jesus. So then the Bible was written in history as God revealed himself in history. So with this, and we'll get more to this, the Bible is two things then. The Bible is both a record of God's revelation in history and is the interpretation of God's revelation in history. It's a record of God's revelation in history and it's the interpretation of God's revelation in history. Why does God want a relationship with us? Because God is love, I think. This is so like, um, you know, behind, behind God's election, right? Behind God's election is a, a beating heart. Um, you get this with Calvinists sometimes where it, God almost feels cold and indifferent, just kind of like eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I choose that guy, don't choose that guy, whatever. Um, that's not how the Bible presents divine election. He, he rescues us because he loves. What's behind that love? Nothing. Because God is love. So, so there, for us, for us there's, there's things that motivate our love, right? Um, it could be good things or bad things, but there's always something motivating our love. God's love is self-generating. He loves us because he loves us. He loves us because it's his nature to love. And so then that motivates him to reveal, to be, make friends with us. So um, it's a mystery of the being of God. Does that answer the question? It's pretty amazing. So here's what Revelation is not about then. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things we could say that it's not about. One that we've already mentioned is like random historical facts. It's not about random historical facts, right? Um, God doesn't reveal to us... Let's talk about the Bible for a minute. God doesn't reveal to us that Joshua walked around the walls of Jericho those times that he did because he thought that was interesting and it's cool and he kind of likes battles. He, d he doesn't reveal to us that um, Samson's hair was cut because he thinks that's interesting. It's just an interesting historical tidbit. He reveals to make friends with us, right? He reveals to make friends with us. Um, God doesn't reveal things about the universe for us to speculate about what the universe is like or not like. He reveals to make friends with us. Um, what does that say about the content of our sermons? Like, like if, if we are allowing God's revelation to serve its purposes in the lives of the people of the church, our sermons should be opportunities for people to respond to the intent of revelation. If the intent of revelation is that God wants to make friends with us, that we might know God in Christ, the whole point of preaching is Christ. We'll get more to that in our homiletics class, but it, it, it has to be the center of everything we say. Otherwise, we're obscuring the intent of God's revelation. It's, it's not just to have interesting tidbits. Not just have, did you know that this about the Pharisees, and did you know this about the Sadducees, and did you know this about the Herodians, and oh, that's very interesting, now I know more about the Bible, so I must be spiritual. No! 
You missed it. Did you know this about Genesis 11 versus Genesis 13 versus Genesis 52? And, and if you compare it linguistically, oh, that's a very interesting tidbit. No, that's not why you're preaching. God is standing behind his word saying, I'm revealing to make friends with my people. I'm revealing to bring them into fellowship with me. And if you, if you as the preacher are standing there giving them something different, God's revelation is not having its intended effect in the life of God's people. He reveals to bring people into relationship with him. The Bible is given to bring people into relationship with God in Christ, which is why our hermeneutics must be Christ-centered. That's why our sermons must be gospel-centered. And, that, and that's why, I, for as interesting as these things might be, you know, ministries which seem to spend all of their time talking about things other than that in the Bible. The Bible and historicity. Yes, the Bible is historical. The Bible and science. Yes, God doesn't say anything that's not true, scientifically true in the Bible. Right? He doesn't say anything scientifically untrue in the Bible. Um, the Bible or even, uh, I remember sitting in a class once and um, someone asked a question and said uh, to the professor and said, you know, I have, I have a lot of people in my church who they, they, they use the Bible to, like, map out these charts of the end times. And, and they've, like, figured out, like, this person's probably the Antichrist. And, and, and maybe it'll happen by this year and things like that. What do you think about that? And you know what the professor said? I think they're wasting their time. Because the Bible is not about figuring that out. The Bible is about Jesus. The Bible is about entering into relationship with God. That's why God reveals in the first place. Any questions on that? It's a quick application note. So, uh, when you wake up tomorrow morning to read your Bible, you wake up tomorrow morning and you're uh, trying to wake up, trying to wake up from sleep, and you pick up that Bible, why are you reading it? If you're reading it for any reason other than knowing God more and having fellowship with God in Christ, you're reading it for the wrong reason. God, God doesn't give us the Bible so that we might know the difference between the Amalekites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the, well, all the otherites. I mean, they're important, and, and I would say they're given, if it's in the Bible, God has no spilled ink, right? God doesn't just say things for the sake of saying it. He says it to bring us into a relationship with Christ, which means there's something in there to reveal Christ to us, right? But he doesn't just give us that information because it's interesting historical facts. He gives it to us to show us his son. Okay, if there's no questions about that, let's talk about general revelation. Let's talk about general revelation. So there's Within God's revelation, so within God's revelation, systematic theologians have typically given two categories, okay? Category one is general revelation versus special revelation. Okay, general revelation and special revelation. Let's start with general revelation. We're, we're, we're narrowing down the focus. We're not talking about revelation in general. We're, talk, we're getting a little bit narrower, and we're working our way to the Bible. So what is general revelation? What are its sources? What are its effects? What's its role? What is it? Well, first of all, the, the sources of general, general revelation, what constitutes general, general revelation, is a debated topic. It is debated. Um, how, do we, how do we determine the sources of general revelation? How do we know what general revelation is communicating? Or even, or even this idea, does God, does God reveal in other religions? 
Right? That, some people would say general revelation includes other religions. I don't think so. At the end of the day, our, our doctrine for what constitutes general revelation, and there's a presupposition here, is determined by Scripture. The Bible tells me what constitutes God's general revelation. And I'll get to why that is later. Number one, nature. Nature. Number one is nature. Um, Romans 1, 18 and the following, which we've already seen. The wrath of God <clears throat> is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. And when did he show it? He's shown it ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. In the things that have been made. Clearly, we're speaking of nature here. God's creation reveals himself. Calvin said this, Men cannot open their eyes without being compelled to see him. Men cannot open their eyes without being compelled to to see him. Let's look at Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night, there's our word, reveals knowledge. The, the word of being poured out, my goodness, it's, 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 it's like a, a pitcher and the water's just pouring out of it. That's, that's what all of creation is doing. It's revealing God. All of creation is revealing God. Look at Psalm 104 2. <clears throat> Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light like a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Okay. The, the idea is, and it goes on to say, basically the earth is a cosmic temple that God created. And stretching out the heavens like a tent, laying the beams, he's, he's saying that it's a tabernacle, right? It's a temple. That's what he's describing here. But, but with that, he robes himself in light. He robes himself in light. What, what's that image? Joel Beakey is helpful here. A king's robes both conceal his body and reveal his majesty. Right? So if a king has his robes on, you can tell, oh, that guy's a king. Right? It shows his majesty, but it also conceals his body. And that's a helpful picture of what general revelation does. It conceals all of his glory, but it shows his majesty. That's what nature does. That's number one, nature. Number two is history. Was there a question? Number two is history. Uh, Romans one twenty. once again. He has been revealing these things since the creation of the world. And he's continuing to do it, right? It doesn't, it, not at the creation of the world, but since the creation of the world. Uh, and, and even, verse 24, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring their bodies among themselves. He's, in the moment, the act of God giving them up is revealing something, right? It's revealing that God is judging them. For their sins. So God has been revealing since the creation of the world. And God's acts of judgment or kindness are all revealing himself. So what does he reveal when he reveals in history? First of all, he reveals his kindness. Matthew 5, 45. He makes the sun rise on the evil and the good. He makes his rain 
He sends his rain on the just and the unjust, right? So human history, the fact that the sun goes up and down, the fact that the rain come, the rains go, all of it is revealing something of the kindness of God. Right? The fact that God sustains human history, the fact that God sustains this world that we live in is a testimony of his kindness. Human history then shows us the kindness of God. Consider Romans 2 verse 4. Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Okay, what's that describing? The fact that he has not killed us. His forbearance and his patience. Oh my goodness, he's, he's slow to anger. He could have destroyed us long ago in judgment, but he hasn't. On a side note, what's the purpose of how does God lead people to repentance? In verse 4, his kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. <clears throat> the, the hellfire and brimstone preachers could learn a thing from this, I think. Um, God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. Right? The graciousness of God is an invitation to come to him. The graciousness and the kindness and the patience of God is an invitation to come to him. So that's one, is his kindness. It also reveals his wrath. Uh, psalm 90 is a psalm. This is the prayer of Moses as the people are wandering in the wilderness. And he says that, Lord, you've been our dwelling place throughout all generation. But look at verse 3. You return men to dust. You say, return children of men. We are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath, we are dismayed. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. Or Luke 13, 2 through 5. You remember this story when there are people who come, who come uh, because Pilate had mingled, in verse 1, mingled uh, blood with their sacrifices. And there's a, and uh, verse 2, Jesus says, do you think the Galileans are worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will also perish. Are these 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them? Do you think they were worse offenders than others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will also likewise perish, right? So he's, he's describing a current event. There's a tower that fell and 18 people died. And Jesus is saying, you need to interpret that rightly. Don't, don't interpret that to say that they are worse sinners than you. Interpret that to say there's a day of judgment coming, which will be far worse than when that tower fell, and you should repent of your sins. Revelation 16, verse 9. They were scorched by fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over the plagues. They did not repent or give him glory. These acts of judgment, which your eschatology class will talk about, my eschatology class will talk about what that even means, the intent is to repent and give God glory. Okay, so history then. Um, next, man. Man. Um, man made in the image of God, right? Man is made in the image of God, and so man reveals something about God, right, as we have already seen in Psalms. Um, human faculty tells us something of God. It tells us that God is a thinking being, um, that God is a feeling being. Uh, our eyes, our ears, our mouth. All of that is meant to reveal something about God to us. But, but with that, because humanity, also human activity. Because humanity, also human activity. Psalm 94, verse 9. He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? In Acts 17, 22 through 29. This is the moment in which... Paul is preaching at the Areopagus, right? And he sees the inscription to the unknown God. And he says, what you worship, we proclaim to you. That God is the Lord. He's not dwelling in a temple, nor is he served by human 
hands. But he has made from one every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him. It is actually not far from each of us. The, the countries that, are, that exist were created by God, is what that says. The boundaries of countries are created by God. So human activity and history is implied here. Does God reveal in other religions in this text? Yes. But he reveals that they're inadequate. Right? They have, a God, they have an idol to the unknown God. So if he does reveal in other religions, it's for the purpose of showing that they are inadequate. Right. Um, Baving makes a big deal about this as well. He he mentions even um, he mentions uh, that that all religions, all religions are inadequate, um, and they point to the need for the Christian God. Uh, that he 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 uses Judaism in the Old Testament, and he compares it to other religions. Right. Judaism has sacrifices and priests and altars, and all of that is meant to point to God. So, so all other religions then show that they need God, just like the Old Testament showed that we need God's revelation in Christ. So humans and human activity, therefore, human conscience as well in Romans 2, 14 through 15, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their consciences also bear witness. So our consciences show us what God is like. Let me read one quote, then I'll answer that question. Joel Beakey says this, We encounter God's general revelation not only in the pristine wilderness, in the broad oceans, but also in city streets, gardens, factories, libraries, kitchens, offices, and many other aspects of the world shaped by human culture. Um, I would say all point to him in that, in their inadequacies, right? They're meant, they're meant to show you that they're limited. I think Acts 17 is a helpful illustration of that. So, so Paul sees all of these altars to all of these gods, and he looks and he says, look, you have an altar to the unknown God. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about, about the God that you don't know about. And he tells him about Jesus. So I think, I think it shows it's, it's an analogy for all religions then. There's a sense in which all religions, in their limitations and in their inadequacies, point to the fact that we need Christ. But what that doesn't mean is, oh, we should listen to what Buddha says on this, and we should listen to what Muhammad says on this, and all of these are revealing God in, in some way that they're revealing truth. Rather, they're revealing the limitations and the fact that we need, we need something more than what this religion has to offer. So they're, they're pointing to God in that way. Um, but, but just in the same way, right? So like no one, and we're about to get to this, no one can look at the trees and become a Christian. No one can look at the sky and become a Christian. In the same way, no one can be a Buddhist and become a Christian. Right? It's, it's showing you I need something more. In the same way that the glories of creation is showing me I need something more, Buddhism and Confucianism and all of that is showing me I need something more. Does that answer your question? So what are, we, we do need to consider of the effects of sin on general revelation, okay? <clears throat> we need to uh, consider the effects of sin on general revelation. Sin has made general revelation insufficient for God's revelation and relationship. Sin has made it insufficient, okay? Sin's, sin has effects on creation itself. If you look at Romans 8, starting in verse 18. Okay, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the, to the glory that will be revealed for us. For the creation waits with eager longing for, for the revealing of the sons of God. The creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected, sub but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the children of God. 
For we know the whole creation is groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves at the first fruit of the Spirit groan inwardly, right? So it's, it's saying creation, creation itself has the curse of sin upon it. It distorts general revelation. It's not absolute. It's not, it's not enough to distort everything and to make sure that general revelation accomplishes none of its purposes, but it, 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 it does distort it so it doesn't accomplish all of its purposes. But, but even, if it, even, if it, even in its fallen state, though, even in its fallen state, creation is revealing something about God, right? So consider Genesis 3. What were the curse? The curse in Genesis 3 was that the ground would bring forth thorns. So do you know what? Thorns, as a result of sin, reveal something about God. He hates sin. Sweat and work, Genesis 3, is a result of the curse. Do you know what? Sweat reveals something about God. So even in its fallen state, it's able to reveal something about God, something true about God. Thorns and sweats and pain and childbirth reveal. It reveals that God hates sin. Sin also has effects on human consciences. So look at Romans 1, 32. Though they know God's righteous decrees, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. All right, so all of us have experienced what it means to have a seared conscience. Um, I think I have that. Titus 1.15. Yeah, to the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. We know different degrees of what it means to have a conscience that's defiled, right? Our consciences don't perfectly align with God's law. But there are different extremes of that also, right? So there, there's a, a spectrum when it comes to a defiled conscience. There's some people who... Um, Psychologists would say have, have no conscience. I don't know what it's. I don't know what that experience is like, but they would claim that they have actual conditions that they have no conscience at all, which would be a further demonstration, right, of God's wrath against sin and giving people over to a, a conscience which has no power to convict. All of that is revealing. Sin has effects on history. Also, think of the story of Habakkuk. Right? The story of Habakkuk. Habakkuk's complaint against God is that human history isn't doing what he would think it would do if God was faithful. Right? So, so Habakkuk comes to God and says, look at Israel. Our, your people, God, your people are unfaithful. God, would you do something about it? And what does God say? I absolutely will. I'm going to send the Babylonians to judge them. And Habakkuk says, not, not what I was thinking. I was thinking maybe you would change them. Um, don't you realize the Babylonians are worse than us? So human history doesn't always reveal in the ways that we would think that it would. Sin has effects on human history. And because of sin, it's not, it's not always clear how God is working in history. It's not always clear how God is working in history because of sin. We do know He is working in history. And history does reveal things about him. Lastly, of course, sin has effects on our minds as well. We already saw Romans 8, verse 7. Sin has effects on our minds. So then, before we talk about special revelation and what it is, I do want to, tell, I want to end this lecture on general revelation by asking what's the relationship between general and special revelation, which we'll talk about about more in the next lecture on special revelation. But in short, general revelation must be supplementary to special revelation. It must be supplementary. It, it, it can't tell us all that there is to know. We need something more. That's number one. But number two, it's subordinate. It's supplementary and it's subordinate. It's subordinate because theological debates must be resolved by Scripture and not by the trees and the moon and the stars and the volcanoes. 
right? No, no one comes to a theological debate. No one does this. No one comes to a theological debate and says, yes, but have you considered the lion's mane? No one says that, nor should they. The scripture is final. Calvin says this, God, foreseeing the inefficacy of his image imprinted on the fair form of the universe, has given the assistance of his word, to whom he has ever been pleased to instruct effectually. We, too, must pursue this straight path. If we aspire in earnest to a genuine contemplation of God, we must go, I say, to the Word, where the character of God drawn from His work is described accurately and to life. These works being estimated not by our depraved judgment, but by the standard of eternal truth, if, as I said, we turn aside from it, how great soever the speed with which we move, we shall never reach the goal because we're off course. We should consider the brightness of the divine countenance, which even an apostle declares to be inaccessible, 1 Timothy 6.16. It's a kind of labyrinth, a labyrinth to us that if the word does not come and guide our path, It's better to limp among the path of God's word than to run with greatest swiftness outside of it.